All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our virtual lecture, Mary Spirit, Icons of the Dormition and Other Haunting Presences. It's been a while since we've gathered in this virtual space, um, so I just wanted to give you a quick update on what's happening at the museum. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Amy Consalvi, and I am the Director of Interpretation here at the museum. And I always welcome feedback um, on our programming, and so if you ever have an idea or, um, you know, a thought about uh, future programs, you know, feel free to send me an email or just email our um, our info at uh, on the museum's website. We're always happy to hear from you. Uh, we have three exciting installations opening next month, uh, including a display of three contemporary Ukrainian icons painted on ammunition boxes salvaged from the war zones. This powerful installation is part of the Buy an Icon, Save a Life project developed by two Ukrainian iconographers. This project raises funds for the first volunteer mobile hospital, the largest non-governmental undertaking to provide medical assistance to the Donbass region. I also want to mention that we are hosting our annual members holiday open house on December 3rd, where you will have the chance to meet our new executive director, Simon Morsink, uh, hear the beautiful Slavic Tunes Choir, and participate in our annual tree lighting. And if you're not a member of the museum, it's never too late. <laughs> you can always join at any time uh, and help support our mission. Uh, I'll put information um, about both of these events and sort of our upcoming events uh, in the chat uh, once we get started. And just as a reminder, we will use Zoom's uh, Q&A feature for questions after the lecture. And now it's really my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Brett Donahoe is a PhD candidate at Harvard University in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures. His dissertation titled The Spectral, Spectral Century, The Ghosts of 19th Century Russian Literature and Performance investigates ghostly figures in Russian religious and artistic culture of the medieval period and 19th century. He also studies Ukrainian and South Slavic poetry and translates from Russian and Bosnian. I do want to mention that Brett was also the recipient of the first annual Raoul and Mary Smith doctoral dissertation research grant and spent several weeks this summer using the museum's extensive library and collections to conduct in-house research. So welcome, Brett, and I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Amy. Let me just uh, share my screen. Um... Is it visible? Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your introduction, Amy. And I'd also like to thank the staff at the Museum of Russian Icons and Raoul Smith, of course, uh, who generously established the Raoul and Mary Smith doctoral research grant, which as Amy said, allowed me to spend part of my summer in the library and collection of the museum. And my time spent there gave me the opportunity to collect and consider the materials for this presentation. Uh, before I begin my discussion, I'd like to provide a brief roadmap of the presentation. Uh, on the right, we see an icon of the death of Theodora from a handmade Russian book. Uh, upon her death, according to the semi-heretical doctrine of aerial tollbooths or Midarstva uh, in Russian, her soul ascends through several tollbooths uh, as it seeks to enter heaven. I simply couldn't not include this icon uh, because of these wonderful skeletons we see here in the bottom left, including one riding a lion. Uh, and uh, also because it presents a different kind of spiritual ascent from what we'll see in the icons of the Dormition of Mary. And just as Theodora's soul ascends uh, to heaven, we'll make progress along the same ladder that she's undertaking. Uh, the first section details icons of the Dormition, their essential features, and their place within Eastern Orthodoxy. Section two focuses on Mary's spirit, broadly defined, um, both within icons of the Dormition and elsewhere. The third section considers iconic thaumaturgy, that is the working of miracles or magic. The fourth section approaches the doctrinal status of icons through the lens of spectrality, uh, seeking to put the field of spectrality studies and icon studies in conversation with one another. Uh, and the final part looks to the present moment, including Russia's war against Ukraine, with a focus on how icons of Mary are being deployed in the current crisis. So let us begin with a look at this beautiful icon held in the Museum of Russian Icons permanent collection shown here on the screen, the Dormition of the Mother of God from about 1750. Icons of the Dormition of Mary are among the most popular and perplexing icons within Eastern Orthodoxy. In Russian, the generic title is Uspenia Presvetoi Bogorodice, 
Um, and it is worth at the very start deconstructing the language we use for these types of icons. Dormition comes from the Latin dormitio, meaning sleep or sleeping. Uspenye enters Russian as a calc from the ancient Greek koinesis. In Old East Slavic, uspenye meant falling asleep, a death. Uh, although it is analyzable in modern Russian through its morphology, the root of uspenye is spot, to sleep, with u, the prefix, imparting a meaning of a more concrete purpose. In both English, Latin, and Russian, icons of the Dormition are icons of sleep. Uh, Orthodox practice affirms that the use of Dormition here indicates that the Virgin died and entered a state of spiritual peace, entering the afterlife without the travail of a painly earthly death. We see in this icon that Mary, laying horizontally on the lower plane, is not asleep but dead. Christ's apostles have been summoned from the corners of the earth and flink uh, Mary's deathbed on both sides. Below that, we see an anti-Semitic caricature of a Jewish man attempting to overturn Mary's deathbed, who was then intercepted uh, and disfigured by an angel. You can see it very briefly, but his arms and his hands are disconnected because it's after the angel has cut his hands off. Um, Christ stands behind his mother, feet hidden so as to obfuscate whether he is standing or floating. Angels are on either side, and a mandorla encompasses him. Uh, visually indicating a disjunction between the fully material world of the apostles and the spiritual world of Christ. In Jesus's hands, though, something interesting makes an appearance. After Mary, after Mary's death, her soul is taken by Christ, who will convey it to heaven. The small figure, encompassed in white, seemingly in the form of a child, is Mary's spirit, her animula, which is the Latin diminutive for the word soul. We should stay with this animula for a while longer. In my view, it breaks the logic of the icon, forcing us into the realm of epistemological mysticism. The power that recalled Christ's apostles to Mary's deathbed is miraculous indeed, but the reduplication of Mary, the disentanglement of her body and soul is something else entirely. To accept that we can see Mary in two different forms, both of which are fully and exclusively Mary herself, disputes our understanding of singular personhood venturing into a mystical realm in which the body and the soul hold proprietary and mutually exclusive claims to their index. Mary's animula in this icon provides occasion for reconsidering ideas of essence. Is Mary her body, her soul, or a combination of the two? In the early centuries of the Christian church, Origen and St. Methodius of Olympus engaged in polemics on this very topic. Bishop Hilarion Alfiev summarized their debates as follows. Uh, quote, Origen's writings reflected the opinion that the bodies of the resurrected will be spiritual and ethereal, but Methodius rejected the view that human bodies will be destroyed, end quote. According to Origen's writings, a person is a soul, and this immaterial essence is that which will be raised in the general resurrection. In Methodius's line of thinking, in contrast, the body and the soul are inextricably linked, with each person being a hybrid creature of both material and ethereal cores. And the raising of the dead will be the awakening of physical bodies that are bound to spiritual centers, according to Methodius. While the appearance of Mary's animula in this genre of icon uh, seems to err on the side of origin, the simultaneity of at least two forms of Mary, one corporeal and one ethereal, points to a more complicated understanding and indeed a withholding of a stance on this, in this debate. Mary remains a singular personage, albeit rent into two distinct embodiments that differ along the lines of materiality of incarnation. Such a construction undermines the premise of singular essence. Mary is both one and more than one. Some icons of the Dormition, such as the one we were just looking at, further complicate this picture through the inclusion of a third Mary, the Queen of Heaven, which we see on the right of the screen, uh, which was previously up at the top um, of the icon. This element is not mandatory in icons of the Dormition, but many do indeed include it. On this slide, we see three incarnations of Mary, all of which invoke different embodiments or lack of embodiment, perhaps. The clothes are also of interest. On earth and in heaven, Mary is dressed the same, while her animula is wrapped in burial vestments, recalling the, icon, uh, the icons of the raising of Lazarus from the grave, as shown here. The pose of Mary and Christ, furthermore, is evocative of the well-known Hodogetria icons, such as this one. 
The semantic content of the Dormition icon reveals a number of valuable citations and constellations. As on earth, so Mary shall be in heaven, for example. The act of resurrection, one of Christ's most well-known miracles, is invoked, and the mother caring for her child becomes the child shepherding the mother's infantilized diminutive spirit from materiality to ethereality. The concept of singular time is also contested through the inclusion of Mary's animula. Just as her personhood is fractured and yet remains singular, temporal dissonance enters this icon through Mary's animula and her throne in heaven. We see her death, her transmigration, and her eternal domain all in one image, as though the three phases were to occur simultaneously. Similarly, the inclusion of the hero martyrs on either side of Mary in distinct vestments prove anachronistic elements in this scene. The pseudo-Dionysus and the Ignatius the God-bearer are often included in icons of the Dormition, seemingly present at the moment of Mary's death, despite their temporal distance from the event. Ignatius of Antioch was of the late first and early second century, while the pseudo-Dionysus tales from the fifth and sixth centuries. Their inclusion in the icon pays tribute to their role in disseminating the narrative of Mary's Dormition in their writings. Icons indeed are not meant to be read as representative images that depict the reality of a given scene, rather they convey both spiritual content and instruction, with the latter teleology accounting for the anachronistic inclusion of these two hero martyrs. Icons of the Dormition almost uniformly invoke these elements. Mary's animula is almost universally depicted as is Christ's presence, with or without his mandorla. The apostles also are, only, are nearly always present, matching the reality of the text that gives rise to the doctrine and providing the viewer with confirmation that they indeed are viewing an icon of the Dormition of Mary. In this icon from a festival tier, the upper plane of, the, of heaven is noticeably absent, but Mary's animula remains. Even on a smaller scale, a panel rather than a standalone icon, the dual incarnation of Mary is depicted and can be understood to be part of the grammar of the icon of icons of the genre, an essential element that allows the icon to communicate and be understood. There are variations, of course, such as this icon from Corfu from the 17th century. Here, Mary is surrounded by three angels. Christ is absent, as is her animula. Yeleni Dimitriado concedes that this icon is highly unusual, writing, quote, this is not the normal form of the Dormition. It is quite different from traditional Byzantine multi-figured representation. It might be more correctly titled the entombment, end quote. Indeed, it is strange and runs counter to much of what tradition has dictated icons of the Dormition to represent, leading Dimitriado to the idea that this is a different scene entirely. These essential features are key in depictions of the Dormition, so much so that even non-iconic representations contain these elements. Even in this tiny pendant, um, measuring just 2.5 centimeters by two centimeters, many of the prototypical features of the Dormition are present, albeit a little hard to see given the loss of definition in the 900 years since its creation. Nevertheless, Mary's reclining figure can be seen here in red, um, her animula in blue, and even the apostles you can see here in the yellow. Um, these features clearly were of enough importance for them to find their expression on such a small scale, requiring painstaking work on behalf of the craftsmen who carved the scene um, and allowing us to conclude that the omission of these elements may break the grammar of the image and lead to the misinterpretation of the icon as a picking a different event. It's important to remember the role of icons in liturgical tradition. For many centuries, broad swaths of the population were functionally illiterate, requiring either oral or visual instruction in religious tales. While the narrative of the Dormition of Mary cannot be found in the Orthodox Bible, its importance within Orthodoxy is well known. The preponderance of icons depicting the scene confirms its role as part of the liturgy, instructing parishioners as to the fate of Mary after her death and offering her as a heavenly intercessor on behalf of those who have not yet joined her in heaven. Icons thus must be minimally legible across different instantiations. One should be able to look at an icon and determine who and what is depicted, regardless of stylistic variation. And they should be able to gain some sort of theological or spiritual instruction from that image. This economy of signs in these icons of the Dormition, for example, includes the animula, attesting to the importance of the transposition of spirit from incarnation to heaven, 
uh, despite disagreements as to the exact nature of this tenet of theology. Doctrines differ with an orthodoxy as to the destination of Mary's physical body. Hans Belting reports the importance of Mary's empty tomb in the establishment of her cult in Byzantium. Furthermore, religious behavior in Byzantium attests to the belief that Mary's physical body was later assumed to heaven after her physical death. Officially, Mary's assumption to heaven is a Catholic doctrine. In practice, though, the Orthodox affirm this belief too, albeit on a less dogmatic level. As Callistus Ware points out in his comments on Mary's assumption, quote, belief in the assumption of the mother of God, of God is clearly and unambiguously affirmed in the hymns sung by the church on the 15th of August. But orthodoxy, unlike Rome, has never proclaimed the assumption as dogma, nor would it ever wish to do so, end quote. Others, however, insist that Mary's assumption is a matter of apocrypha rather than canon, and thus refuse to recognize her current state in dormition. Before moving on to the next section, which concerns Mary's spirit, I'd like to provide a brief counterpoint to the icons of the Dormition from a different tradition. In Catholic art, it is not the Dormition depicted, but rather the assumption of Mary, as seen here in this image, not icon, from Titian. Catholic doctrine differs from Orthodox teaching um, in many significant ways, with some Catholic theologians asserting that Mary died and then was assumed into heaven, with bodily resurrection possibly. <laughs> Orthodoxy typically holds that Mary experienced physical death, and then her soul was received. Um, oh, sorry, I said I will slow down. Um, and then her soul was received uh, uh, into heaven, um, with bodily resurrection possibly intervening. Orthodoxy typically holds that, um, or Mary's soul was received by Christ and then conveyed to heaven, with her physical body joining her in heaven in anticipation and rehearsal for the general resurrection. Mary's role in orthodoxy cannot be understated, and her spirit is of great importance not only when it finds its visual representation, such as in icons of the Dormition, but also in other icons of various genres and the narratives surrounding her ability to help those on earth and in hell from her throne in heaven. Cults of Mary proliferate in both Eastern and Western Christianity, and it comes as no surprise that a vast number of icons portray elements of her life and afterlife. In their study of Mary in Russian culture, Vera Shezov and, and Amy Singleton Adams contend that, quote, through her icons, Russian believers related to Mary as if to a living person, end quote. Indeed, icons of Mary carry an appreciable force, one that is not delimited to the narratives they convey, nor the holy subject material of their representative mode. Take, for instance, this remarkable icon, uh, the appearance of the mother of God Tichinskaya, which portrays a group of fishermen being visited by a popular icon of Mary, held aloft by angels. The text at the bottom of the icon reads, placing the icon of the mother of God Tichinskaya within the bounds of the city of Novgorod on the lake. Narratives of Mary's post-mortem appearance to believers and unbelievers alike are numerous, but this is a different modality altogether. Rather than Mary assuming a physical form and visiting these fishermen, she conveys her spirit and guidance through her icon. Perhaps now it is time to complicate the notion of representation as it relates to icons. According to Orthodox theology, icons are not images of that which they represent. They are the very thing that they depict. In Orthodoxy, the icon presents the viewer with actual presence of the holy figure represented. According to George Fedotov in volume one of the Russian Religious Mind, quote, every icon was a mystery in itself, not only as an image of the divine world, but as its real presence on earth. The saints were really present in their relics as well as in their icons, end quote. Matthew Steenberg confirms this notion in his essay on the church in the Cambridge Companion to Orthodox Christian Theology, writing, quote, through the communion with this God who is beyond time, the church engages in the reality of the thing remembered. The communion of the saints is not merely the recollection of past lives of holiness, but a genuine presence, the intercommunion of the living with the departed, end quote. Within the system in which icons of Mary were created, 
they were not a means of representing or conveying the virgin. Rather, it might be more appropriate to think of icons as windows, thre thresholds through which the contemporary parishioner may engage with the real reality of that which they see. Accordingly, the fishermen here are not viewing an icon of Mary per se, they are communing with Mary herself as mediated through her icon. Her spirit is not relegated to heaven, nor is she delimited by space, time, or ontology. She is present according to Orthodox theology and capable of interacting with those not yet in heaven through both physical appearances and her icons. Despite the doctrine of presence within the image, icons were not created with the intent of summoning or conjuring those represented. Rather, icons work with the whole of the church structure and the aim of shepherding the viewer through a certain religious experience. From their visual composition, icons invite the viewer to transcend that very role as observer and become a participant in the scene depicted. Abolishing the distinction between the world of reality and the world of appearance. Through viewing an icon, the living person enters into the reality of the image, a constitutively bygone world populated by those who are no longer living in the world exterior to the icon. Indeed, as Boris Spensky argues in the semiotics of art, the depiction becomes the sign of the depicted reality. One of the methods by which the icon painters are to, able to ensure this effect is through the use of reverse perspective, which places the vanishing point of the image outside the icon, creating the sensation that the viewer and the viewed are part of a singular reality. How then does the icon become a real presence on earth, as Fedotov argues in his study of the religious culture of medieval Rus? It is through the mystical nature that undergirds orthodoxy as a whole. The Greek contemporary Orthodox thinker Callistus Ware writes, quote, all true Orthodox theology is mystical, just as mysticism divorced from theology becomes subjective and heretical. So theology, when it is not mystical, degenerates into arid scholasticism, academic in the bad sense of the word, end quote. The religious nature of the icon is of key importance, as Ware writes, quote, it is one of the ways whereby God is revealed to man. Through icons, the Orthodox Christian receives a vision of the spiritual world, end quote. Not only do icons reveal a spiritual realm to man, but they also interact with one another in the creation of a symphony of postmortem voices and narratives within the church's walls. Time collapses in these interactions. Mary comes to inhabit the same space as Old Testament figures and later religious personages as shown in this deistus, which places Mary to the right of Christ. All the while, the parishioner is embodied in a material world that is even further along in time than the scenes depicted in the icons. The temporal experience of an Orthodox church is dizzying, as the icons present the viewer with a reality that is simultaneously co-evil and anachronistic. Furthermore, the viewer come participant engages in dialogue with those who have experienced a physical death, yet still exert a palpable and appreciable force. To take a brief detour into the world of imaginative literature, Nikolai Liskov's 1872 text, The Sealed Angel, reifies the mystical nature of icons in the eyes of believers. In this narrative, an old believer icon has been confiscated and desecrated by the mainstream church. The act of sealing the icon with wax to these old believers is not only blasphemous, but it also deprives the icon of its mystical energies. Their mission is to retrieve the icon and free the angel shown in the icon from its seal, returning the icon to its proper level of respect and veneration. To these old believers, icons are not merely religious instruments by which they can focus their spiritual practice. <clears throat> Rather, the icon is a key part of the liturgy consecrated by God, imbued with power, and deserving of respect and appreciation. Even to those who deny the doctrines of particular sects as to the power of icons of one form or another, there is an appreciable force that seems to emanate from icons. In the Skull story, the mainstream Orthodox Church seeks to correct a heresy through their sealing of the icon, engaging in a ritualistic cleansing and binding of the power that emanates from the object despite a profession to the incorrect dogma that gave rise to the icon. Similar to Cormac in Painting the Soul, 
icons, death masks, and shrouds, presents a story about Yeho the Getria icon from Arona's Crete, which is shown on the screen now. As Cormac relates, the power of such an icon, quote, to offer the living saint to the viewer is an effective one. For some, it was too powerful, end quote. At some point, someone attacked this icon, leaving deep permanent scratches on Mary's right eye. Crete had a long history of Orthodox and Catholic cohabitation, and the island was under Ottoman rule for several centuries. It is unclear who to face this, this icon, but it is unlikely to have been done by an Orthodox believer, given the sanctity of the icon in Orthodox theology. Cormac surmises that the attack, quote, either indicates a belief that eyes held the key to the living and marks an attempt to kill Mary, or shows that for someone, at least, the icon contains the evil eye, end quote. Either conclusion indicates the firm belief in the mystical properties of the icon, even when divorced from the theological underpinnings of orthodoxy. Clearly, the ability of the icon to create a presence is not achieved exclusively through adherence to doctrine or dogma. The formal composition and the contextual environment of the icon play a role in the perception of supernatural energies. Returning to Mary's spirit, the focus of this section, it's important to remember that icons are but one mean of, of conveying the spirit. While icons are held to achieve an actual presence, according to Orthodox doctrine and reinforced through a variety of liturgical and formal designs, Mary is not delimited to her icon and her spirit is not bound to objects that seek to translate her presence into visual form. Within Russian Orthodoxy, Mary has been said to appear or otherwise make her interaction known to believers and non-believers alike in a variety of different narratives. Her veneration finds resonance not only in Orthodox circles, an invocation of her name and status has at times caused great upset to the Orthodox community. One such example can be found in Pussy Riot's punk prayer performance at the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow on February 21st, 2012 almost a decade to the day before Vladimir Putin, the chief villain of the group's song, began his invasion of Ukraine, which was blessed by the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. One would hardly characterize Pussy Riot as a group of adherent observers of orthodoxy, but their protest song displays a veneration of the Virgin Mary, reifying the power of her spirit, whether in religious or secular terms, to provide inspiration and guidance. The song begins, Bagarodica Dieva Putina Pragani, Mother of God, Virgin, drive Putin away. Later, the group entreats Mary to become a feminist. Bagarodica Dieva Stan Feministko. Uh, Mother of God, Virgin, become a feminist. The group appeals to Mary, not to the angels nor to Christ himself, because the narrative of Mary has extended beyond her religious significance becoming both in a mythical icon of deliverance and kindness and a cultural code, one which can be relied upon by both believers and non-believers. Her spirit extends beyond her religious significance and perhaps her tripartite figuration in icons of the Dormition is a good metaphor for understanding this. Mary is a dying woman fully on earth and fully part of mankind, regardless of religious affiliation or lack thereof, but Mary is also an animula, a spiritual presence that is capable as, of existing as part of the physical world while lacking physical embodiment. But Mary is also simultaneously the queen of heaven, a religious figure of a very high echelon. These three instantiations can exist simultaneously and all have equal claim to the entity that we call Mary. Beyond her spiritual staying power though, Mary has been associated with various miracles since her very childhood and through to the present day. Just as narratives of Mary's dormition was, an, was a retrograde creation from after her death, religious figures have fleshed out the whole story of Mary's life, um, have read the whole story of Mary's life from her conception onward in the centuries since her physical passing. Despite a lack of basis in the gospel in the New Testament, Apocrypha, namely the second century proto-evangelium of James, crafted a narrative of Mary's parents, Joachim and Anne, leading to their veneration as saints. 
Various accounts attest to Anne's immaculate conception of Mary, who was born without original sin, and veneration of St. Anne finds its early evidence in the construction of a church in her name in Constantinople during the reign of Justinian during the sixth century. Regardless of canonical scriptural evidence and attestation, Mary has been associated with the bevy of miracles beyond her virgin birthing of Christ. In the East Slavic context, many of these miracles are associated with her icons. I choose here to use the word thaumaturgy, meaning the working of miracles or magical feats, as it encompasses mystical events reported by lay people and also those as recognized, recognized as miracles by the official church structures. Within both Catholicism and Orthodoxy, Mary is a thaumaturgic force, and, her, and stories of her visage appearing in various objects or statues of her crying uh, proliferate in popular culture. This is not a new phenomenon. Just as was the case with the appearance of the mother of God Tichinskaya icon, Mary's icons have been variously associated with protection for the peoples of Russia. The inscription at the, at the bottom of this icon compels, the placement, compels its placement in Novgorod so that the city may find its safety. The golden energy emanating from the icon, which is held aloft by angels, portends this veil of protection. And the man standing to our right on the icon, but on the icon's left, um, visually rhymes with the depiction of Christ within the icon, implying a maternal sense of protection and duty coming from Mary to the fishermen, and by extension, the people, the community they are part of. Perhaps the most famous icon of Mary in Russian culture is the Vladimir Mother of God from 1131, shown here. This icon has been associated primarily with the protection of the city of Moscow. Importantly, this is not a Russian icon or even an icon of, from Rus. Rather, it was a gift to the city of Constantinople before being transferred to Vladimir, where it remained until 1395. Afterward, it was transferred to Moscow, where it has remained since. There are nearly a millennia's worth, millennium's worth of narratives of its miraculous power uh, to recount, so I'll offer just a few anecdotes that have accumulated around this important icon. Allegedly, as it was being transferred from Kyiv, the horses carrying the icon stopped in Vladimir and refused to go for further. And this was interpreted by the locals as Mary expressing her desire to remain in the city. By the time the icon found its way to Moscow, Tatar hordes were attacking Rus. According to legend, Vasily I of Moscow spent a woeful night in prayer in front of this icon, shedding many tears. And the Mongol armies retreated from their advance toward Moscow the very next day. After the Soviet Revolution, the icon was transferred from a church to an art gallery, as the state considered it a work of art rather than an object of religious significance because of the state's official policy of atheism. This did not stop Joseph Stalin, however, from reportedly relying upon the power of this icon during the Nazi attack on Moscow. According to Viktor Volokhov, a Moscow city official, Stalin had the icon removed from the Tretikov art gallery and loaded on a plane, which then circled Moscow several times before the German attack in a scene reminiscent of the appearance of the mother of God, Tichvinskaya icon. Even to Stalin, who enforced the uh, policy of official atheism, the thaumaturgic powers attributed to this icon were attractive, and he sought to capitalize on them, perhaps as a last ditch effort for the protection of Moscow, without acknowledging the cognitive dissonance in the act. And as we all know, the Soviet Union prevailed against Germany in the Battle of Moscow. Another fascinating narrative surrounding an icon of Mary can be found in the Mother of God Kazanskaya icon, an example of which is shown here. Once again, this is a Byzantine icon, although it was transferred to Rus later in the 13th century. Once the Khanate of Kazan was established, the history of this icon becomes murky, uh, and it reemerged a century and a half later. The story surrounding the recovery of this icon is that Mary appeared in a vision to a young girl to tell her that this icon was buried beneath a house that had been destroyed by fire, and it had been buried there during the initial invasion of Kazan. 
Once the church officials were able to locate the icon below the rubble and the dirt, they found that the icon was entirely undamaged despite the circumstances. It has been credited since with helping Russia repel invasions from Poland and Sweden um, in various wars, and it is most prominent for helping, uh, for helping to ward off Napoleon's invasion of Moscow. For these feats, the icon has gained the title Holy Protectress of Russia. Allegedly, it was destroyed in the early 20th century, which is why now we are looking at a copy or uh, an icon in the style of, this, of the original rather than the icon itself. Some believers have since attributed the hardships of the 20th century in Russian history to this icon's disappearance. Marian icons are the palladiums of Russia. That is to say, they are images and objects upon which the safety of the nation is said to depend. While icons often rehearse within their frames various miracles, such as the resurrection of Lazarus or the Dormition of Mary, the icons themselves bear thaumaturgic associations. This goes hand in hand with orthodox doctrine surrounding iconography. Icons are not mere objects, nor are they representations. The icon is that which is depicted within its frame. The miracle of protection that the icons of Vladimir and Kazan are said to have accomplished is an external rehearsal of the very miracle that is shown in the images, the miracle of Christ of Mary's protection of a young Christ. Indeed, icons within orthodoxy do not merely contain a spirit, they convey a spirit, they project it. That is to say, they are new metaphoric, as Michel Cano contends in his monograph, The Resurrection and the Icon. I would like now to turn to a much different argument, one predicated upon the theoretical debates of the 1990s and 2000s concerning the nature of the spectrum lens and the framework of Derridian deconstruction. The terms I've been employing thus far, spirit, presence, thaumaturgy, all invoke in different ways the uncanny nature of the ghostly. While our minds are likely primed through the proximity of Halloween to linger upon the connotations of ghosts and evil, I would like to foreground the mere denotation of ghosts as the presence of those who have experienced physical death within the world of the living. Within this broad, perhaps too broad definition of the ghost, a whole host of liturgical figures would fall into its categorization, including Mary and the saints. By way of clarification, Lazarus immediately after his resurrection would not, since he was not returning as a different form, he was returning in his original form uh, and his death was reversed. And neither would Elijah from the Hebrew Bible as he ascended to heaven on his fiery chariot without first experiencing death. If we follow the logic of orthodoxy and if affirm the post-mortem miracles of Mary, as well as the doctrine, the doctrine of iconic presence, we are left with a spectral conclusion, one that provides occasion for the type of deconstructive work that I've already danced around throughout in this presentation. After the 1993 publication of Jacques Derrida's Spectres of Marx, cultural criticism undertook a spectral turn, so to speak, in which scholars paid increasing attention to the seeming ominous presence of ghostly figures in disparate superstructures and cultural vocabularies. In this seminal text of critical theory, Derrida seizes upon the ghostly father in Hamlet as the occasion and vehicle for deconstructing temporality, chronology, and alterity. And the specter begins to function as a, quote, deconstructive liminal figure hovering between life and death, presence and absence, and making established certainties vacillate, end quote, as Colin Davis uh, writes in a summary of Derrida's complex theory. Icons operate in a similarly deconstructive fashion, calling into question a bevy of boundaries in terms of temporality and ontology. Through this line of thought, icons function as proto-deconstructive agents akin to Derrida specters. Um, as we saw in the temporal description of the permission of Mary, icons do not operate through the same logic of chronology as we do. Rather, they may contain within their borders elements of wildly different temporal provenances, and the mystical logic of orthodoxy allows for a spatial unity of these time signatures within an icon. 
Though not naming the Dormition icon specifically, Vladimir Darievsky presents such examples as instantiations of the different counterintuitive structuring of relationships within the icon. Quote, an icon can depict in one area, excluding scenes around the margins, events that took place at different times, as if demonstrating that the events of the Holy Scriptures take a different form in spiritual space, end quote. I would like to stay with this notion of spiritual space. Much of what gets left unsaid in the writings of Orthodox thinkers is the determination of the mystical, opting for faithful agnosticism as to the inner workings of this other realm. If icons present us with windows into the spiritual space, we can conclude that the logic of temporality operates under very different conditions there. To allow for the collision of figures from the Hebrew Bible with entities from the Gospels, and even occasionally more contemporary local saints, is to engage in a deconstruction of linearity, asserting that our mortal understandings of chronology fail to account for the full functioning of time. Whereas we divide our timelines into past, present, and future, icons do not, and all three can exist simultaneously. Furthermore, on an extrinsic level, icons further work to deconstruct the boundaries between materialism and idealism. The precise nature of the icon is contingent upon the personal religious convictions of the viewer, becoming a subjectively defined variable that oscillates in semiotic content based on the um, based on its spectator. For some, it is egg tempera on wood. For others, it is an instantiation of divine presence, a rehearsal of God godly incarnation, and the creation of a window through which one may access a spiritual world. As we have already seen, thinkers affirm the actual presence of that which is depicted in an icon. Icons of the Dormition are not images of the Dormition, but they are the Dormition itself. To believe that the icon creates a, a real presence rather than merely a metaphorical attendance is to assert the supremacy of godly logic over one own one's own faculties of understanding, ceding epistemological authority and finding comfort and confirmation in agnosis. The icon becomes part and parcel of the manifestation of God, reinforcing and representing the incarnation of God in human flesh. As such, the icon lies at the heart of religious practice within Eastern Orthodoxy. But Dimer Loski explains the importance as follows, quote, the cult of holy images which expresses things in themselves invisible and render them really present, visible and active. An icon or cross does not exist simply to direct our imagination during prayers. It is a material center in which there reposes an energy, a divine force, which unites itself to human art, end quote. This divine force has the ability to manifest into contemporary existence non-coeval entities. Following the logic of those who insist on the mystical power of the icon to conjure the actual presence of who is depicted, the modern parishioner in the 21st century is able to cohabitate a space with bygone saints, the Virgin Mary, and the prophet Elijah. While these figures are holy and of a separate class, they are not affirmed as divine in the same way as Christ. As such, the summoning of their presence through their presentation, of the, through the presentation of their image is the manifestation of mortal people, albeit in their sanctified and venerated forms. In his study of saints within Catholicism, Peter Brown cordons off this class as the quote, very special dead. Allowing another scholar of Western European religious culture, Jean-Claude Schmidt, to dismiss the argument of including saints and the Virgin Mary in the category of ghost or spectral. While this may be applicable to the Catholic situation, there's ample evidence given the mystical orientation of orthodoxy for the labeling of such figures as ghostly. If a ghost is really the manifest presence of the dead in the world of the living, to deny the spectral nature of the saints is either to refute their refuse their humanity and their participation in the common law of physical death, or it is to undermine the mystical quality of the icon and its ability to produce an actual presence as affirmed in a wide variety of doctrinal sources. Following the reasoning of orthodoxy through the lens of deconstruction leads us to the understanding that the ghosts conveyed through icons imbue their surroundings with a mystical supernatural presence, 
one whose understanding requires reconsideration of notions of temporality, ontology, and epistemology. Attendance to the figure of the specter foregrounds these questions, and the ability of icons to compel, compel such thoughts is part and parcel of their pedagogical power. Turning to my final section of the talk, I would like to discuss a strange phenomenon that has been spotted in recent days in Moscow. Billboards of the mother of God style of icons have begun to pop up throughout the capital city. And I'll show three such examples here. As we saw earlier, this style of icon is particularly associated with protection of Russia, as was the case with the Virgin of Vladimir icon and the mother of Kazanskaya icon. Icons of Mary have been thought to provide comforts during times of uncertainty. Um, and anxiety for many centuries, and it is no coincidence that these icons now form a highly visible part of the built environment of Moscow, especially after the unrest caused by Putin's orders of mobilization. In the months and years prior to Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the rhetoric of Russian ethnogenesis began to shift at the highest levels, and this can be seen so clearly in downtown Moscow, with the monument to St. Vladimir, or the monument to Vladimir the Great, which was unveiled in 2016. The curious thing with the statue, though, as many have pointed out, is that St. Vladimir, or Volodymyr, depending on whether you're speaking Russian, Old East Slavic, or Ukrainian, died several centuries before anything that could simply be called Moscow existed. He was the baptizer of Rus, not Russia, and the modern day state of the Russian Federation is certainly a descendant of that which the saint ruled over more than, a, more than a millennium ago, but it is not the sole inheritor of that legacy, nor is it the natural continuation of Kiev and Rus. Nevertheless, the legitimacy of the Russian Federation and the support Putin finds for his wanton war against Ukraine comes precisely from this type of historical revisionism and usurpation of legacy. I want to emphasize here that I'm not claiming that modern day Ukraine has the right to claim the whole legacy of Kiev and Rus either. I don't think that one can draw clear lines of inheritance or lineage from the year 900 to today. The newly installed icon billboards of Mary perform the same type of task as does the statue of St. Vladimir in Moscow. The employment of religious rhetoric and liturgical doctrine in support of a state apparatus that finds its legitimacy in conjunction with the church. The protection that Hodegetria icons have allegedly provided throughout the years has caused them to be symbolically connected with safety and security, two things that the Russian state seeks to project in the capital during an active war. However, it is important to remember whose stories are being told in the installation of works such as this. Mary's aura of protection is an element of Orthodox Christianity. While we have seen narratives of non-believers who attest or perform a belief in the power of icons of Mary, despite a, a lack of personal theological basis, the choice of Christian imagery to project stability and security makes a clear statement to that those who do not adhere to doctrines concerning Mary are not afforded her veil of protection. While Mary is venerated in Islam as well, and she is the only woman with a name in the Quran. She has a surah of the Quran at named after her, and she is revered as the greatest woman to have ever lived. Her veil of protection is practiced and supported exclusively within Christianity. The imposition of religious imagery of the dominant, but by no means exclusive religious tradition in order to communicate that things will be okay is a targeted message. And it seeks to cultivate a national identity that is rooted in religious imagery to the exclusive groups and individuals who may form part of the community, but differ, um, but differ in their faith tradition. This and then the images of the Virgin holding anti-tank weapons in Ukraine, again, a use of this protection. So this is the precisely the same teleology as the statue of Vladimir. Not only does the statu statue engage in anachronistic revisionism, and seek to claim total control of a heritage that should have no proprietary ownership. It further indicates the importance of conversion to Christianity, to the myth of Russian ethnogenesis, projecting an understanding of national identity that is concomitant with the negation of non-Orthodox religious traditions. 
However, just as the legacy of Kievan Rus does not belong to any one nation or society, neither does Mary. While Orthodox and Catholic versions of Christianity include the notion of Mary offering protection, that is but just one aspect of her character that can be appreciated and venerated. For many others, both within and without religion, Mary has been a source of guidance, just as her character provided inspiration for Pussy Riot in their performance in the Cathedral of Christ the Savior. Mary can be removed from religion, but she cannot be taken out of the context of spirituality in a spectral lay lens. Let's return briefly to Pussy Riot's performance. They address Mary as though it were a prayer at the start, while the rest of the song fits their punk protest oral aesthetics more closely. The conceit of musical prayer works well in this context, as it casts their request to remove Putin as a religious calling. However, in emulating a prayer, the performers of Pussy Ray obliquely attest to the spectral nature of Mary in her ability to listen to and receive the request. Indeed, the second refrain of this prayer to Mary uses the word dievol, and here I'm emphasizing that the ending is o rather than a, even though in modern Russian, because of vowel reduction, they are pronounced the same. So they use the word dievol rather than dieva. Dievo is an uh, archaic vocative form, a relic of a case that exists in modern everyday Russian in just two words. Or an attempt to God. Um, and Boje, another way of addressing God directly. The performers of Pussy Ray address Mary directly through this vocative, breaking the veil of that which separates the material and spiritual worlds, even without, perhaps, the concession of belief in Mary's dormition or assumption. While the members of Pussy Riot may lack personal belief in Mary's post-mortem ascent into heaven, either in spiritual or material form, she remains a presence, an interlocutor, capable of being addressed and even petitioned nearly two millennia after her physical demise. For this reason, I believe, icons are so associated with the thaumaturgic power, principally the power of protection in the case of Marian icons. Marian iconography is so omnipresent and the cult of Mary is so developed that she becomes a key source of comfort, both religiously and in terms of cultural significance. While Mary is the queen of heaven and the best of all intercessors for an Orthodox believer, she remains a spiritual, not religious force that is available for guidance and support outside of doctrinally liturgical contexts. Indeed, even to the non-believer, Mary's physical death is not the end of her story. Mary belongs to everyone, and to each person there is a different Mary. To close this presentation, I would like to return to the icon of the remission that we started with. Here we are presented with Mary in three distinct, yet interrelated and ontologically tense forms, physical embodiment, spiritual essence, and heavenly manifestation. All three are fully and exclusively Mary, and the illogical entailments of that statement reflect a central tenet of the very spectrality that Mary's figure and perhaps icons in general exhibit. Derrida's early remarks on the specter draw attention to the paradoxical nature of the figure, whom he labels both arrivant, that which arrives, and revenant, that which returns. Indeed, ghosts return from the past, but their arrival in the present is a novelty, something entirely new. By returning, they are appearing for the first time in their new immaterialized post-mortem form. Rather than attempting to resolve this paradox for providence, focusing on the spectral compels us to remain in the realm of epistemological uncertainty, allowing for the assertion of contradictory and mutually exclusive elements without attempting to resolve their incongruities. The case of icons or the figure of Mary for a non-believer, for example, is a great illustration of this nature. Although those who scratched Mary's eye out in Crete did not attest to the power of icons, most likely, and although Pussy Riot members do not profess strong religious inclinations, there is something confoundingly powerful to be found in Orthodox iconography and the insistence on the actual presence of these bygone non-coeval figures in the world of the living. Icons, even when removed from the context of religious doctrines that would seem to assign them their power, project, project an air of thaumaturgy, as though miracles can and do happen in their presence. This ability to subvert one's purported faculties of logic is part and parcel of the spectral quality of icons, 
as they deconstruct the boundaries of materialism and idealism, temporality, epistemology, and even ontology. Through presenting the viewer come participants with a real presence, or at least the feeling of a real presence, icons are able to transmit a spirit across modes of representation, distances in space and time, and across the borders of belief systems. Just as Mary ascends from her physical resting space to heaven with an intermediary step along the way, icons present us with a case study in how a physical object is able to achieve an ethereal aura, paradoxically being totally and contradictorily both a material entity and a spiritual presence. Through the lens of Derridian deconstruction and spectrality studies, the irreducibility and paradoxical essence of icons becomes clear. The spectral, spiritual, haunting aspect of iconography finds its relief in both theoretical and theological considerations of the matter. In Mary's Nimula, her tiny spirit in Christ's hands and icons of the Dormitions both encapsulates and miniaturizes the profound religious and cultural thaumaturgy and hauntology of icons in the Russian context. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Uh, the one downside to Zoom webinars is that you don't get the magnificent applause that you <laughs> deserve at the end of your lecture. Uh, but thank you. That was that was truly fascinating, and it was so neat, um, you know, to kind of see where where all of your research went. Um, you know, spending all those weeks in the museum library and and uh, spending time up in collection storage and. And this is it. Um, so that's that's really neat. And you know, for any student, I, I know we have some students in the audience. Um, the museum does offer uh, several internships throughout the year. Uh, so if this is, you know, if if Russian studies or or icons is something that really speaks to you, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll hopefully be announcing our internships for next year. Um, I would say probably in January or February. But um, you know, we we love working with students. So, um, and Brett, thank you for uh, you know just really being part of our team and producing this great research and you know I look forward someday to reading your full <laughs> dissertation oh, um, so, so if, if folks have have any questions um, feel free to uh, use the Q&A feature um, I'm pretty good at checking both Q&A and chat so if you want to use the chat that's uh, fine as well and I'm curious I mean you touched on on, on the Quran very briefly but have have you or are you planning to look at Mary um, in any other cultures um, I'm thinking, you know, Mexico, for example. Yeah, so there's so much, like, the more you look, the more there is. Um, mm -hmm. I, for time constraint reasons, I cut out a section where I was going to look at um, icons of the Dormition within uh, Oriental Orthodox churches. Mm -hmm. um, there's some distinction, like, in Armenian iconography, her soul is being conveyed to heaven by angels rather than by Christ. Um, and in uh, still in the Eastern Orthodox context in Serbian iconography, she's not covered in white, she's covered in like a flesh color aura. Um, but these uh, notions of Mary and apparitions are so widespread and um, heavily reported on, especially in the Catholic context in mm -hmm. cases like in uh, Mexico, in Spain. Um, and it seems like every time you hear a virgin of so-and-so or virgin of X place, there's people who see who have seen her or can report miracles directly attributed to her. And this is not, of course, a modern phenomenon. It's been going on since pretty much since Mary died. People have been seeing her since then. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so turning over to the Q&A. Uh, so very quickly, um, Mary Taylor would like to know if this lecture will be available on our website. Yes. So everyone who registered uh, for the program, you'll receive a copy of the recording on Monday, along with a program survey, and then it'll be available for free on our website um, in about a month. Um, so feel free to share with friends. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, so Stephanie, Stephanie Sandler um, says, thank you for the excellent lecture. I'm curious about those icon billboards. Does their appearance outside of the church, not painted by monks, affect their capacity to be spiritual or to haunt? Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question, Stephanie. Those icon billboards, I just saw them this past week um, online, and they're so very, very strange, and I don't have a ton of information about them. I, I don't think their appearance outside of a church necessarily affects it because icons find um, 
find their homes in many different places, including, of course, the icon corners that were very popular at one point, and to some degree still today in uh, the homes of believers, um, and, but then not painted by monks. I think it, perhaps on a exclusively doctrinal level, they would not carry the same sort of power as the icons painted by monks um, and affixed to specific places, such as an icon corner or a position in church. Um, but I think kind of on a cultural level, it doesn't affect it too much because this notion of you see this icon and you feel Mary's presence, if you are a believer and you believe in this type of stuff, that you feel Mary's presence and all of the cultural associations as well as the religious associations come into being for you. So it's kind of, it's a ghost if you want it to be a ghost uh, and it haunts if you let it haunt. And this is also part of the, one of the most recent pushes within spectrality studies is this idea of what do we allow to haunt us? And what can that tell us about our societies? Where like these billboards through this lens are haunting Moscow um, and recalling different invasions in which these type of icons protected Moscow um, and so it's allowing the specter of unrest and uh, the need for protection to haunt the physical and built environment. Great. Uh, so Diane would like to know, uh, what's the description of the sources of energy, in parentheses, power for the spirits, whether they are the traditional ghost, such as you know the ghost of a grandmother or a deceased family member, um, or a saint or Mary? Um, let me think about this. So I think it very much depends on the person and what they believe and how they, again, how they allow themselves to be haunted in this way. Um, there are, of course, people who believe very fervently in that there are actual ghosts and we can't know where they come from or how they are created. There are different beliefs about Ghosts come from the devil. In medieval Russian sources, oftentimes someone who died a bad death, someone who died before their time or by suicide uh, or died experiencing a bad burial, the devil was able to resurrect their soul and they were able to haunt. So people who died by suicide, for example, to protect them, they were buried at crossroads so that people would consistently be making the sign of the cross over them. So these sources of energy, I think, are defined by how they are for you. Um, if this, the memory of your grandmother, for example, haunts you, or you feel as though your grandmother's ghost is haunting you, it could be your belief in a spiritual um, presence that prevents, that provides these experiences or provides this energy, or it could be a mental presence. I think one way of thinking about ghosts is the ability to uh, mourn or the inability to mourn in certain cases. Um, in Gothic literature, the ghost is often given its power through a secret and the uncovery of that secret vanquishes the ghost. So um, I think it just depends on how you see the ghost, how the ghost comes to you. I like that answer. <laughs> Great. Um, so, uh, and we have an anonymous question. Um, do you think uh, ghost is the appropriate English term for the induction of the spiritual when gazing upon iconography? Um, if not, what other word do you think would be apt to describe the presence invoked? I think ghost is a um, an appropriate term. I think using its synonyms as well is helpful. If we look at the root of specter, for example, um, it's related to such words as spectacle, spectator, um, and this is true in many different languages. In Russian, the word for specter, prividenia, which is also a common word for ghost, its root is vidit, to see. Um, and so I think, but then there are also the, these accumulations that have um, developed within the critical literature for phantoms are psychoanalytic elements Devote, or devised by principally um, Torok and uh, Abraham. And, and so they are, phantoms means this, whereas specter is a Derridian idea of deconstruction. Um, and I think ghost is the more neutral term that just, if we just take it to its most basic level, someone who has died, who is still here with us and who can still be present to us. Um, so I guess, the, um, 
I, I personally think ghost is the most appropriate word, but also I've been spending so much time with the terminology that I kind of almost feel like I'm desensitized to the growth, to the to that concept of ghost. Um, and that's why I wanted to include in there. I'm not saying that ghosts are evil. I'm just because I spend so much time reading about ghosts that I sometimes forget uh, <laughs> the connotations outside of critical literature sort of. Sure, sure. <laughs> so I think we have time for let's let's address two more questions. Uh, I think there's there's one in the chat I'd like to go to. Um, but first, uh, Raul. Uh, Raul Smith says, towards the end of your talk, you tend to be approaching icons from a quantum mechanical position. Have you thought of that, especially justifying the, the simultaneity, I'm saying that word, <laughs> of the occurrence of activities in icons? Uh, yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thank you, Raul. Um, and I, it's been suggested to me before that this kind of openness to different times and depending on where you're looking at, um, it is very quantum mechanical in its nature. And um, I've been advised I should probably chat with some quantum physicists uh, to, to uh, see what we can come up with. Um, but I think also it relates to the formal construction of the icon, its use of reverse perspective or multiple vanishing points in different cases that you can only look at one thing at once. And so that becomes your reality in that moment. But when you appreciate the whole thing together, that's when these different time signatures, as Vladimir Dariyevsky points out, come into play. So when you're kind of, when you're reading an icon of the Dormition, you start perhaps with Mary's um, reclining body, and in that moment she's dead, and then just as her soul ascends, so does your uh, gaze, and then she becomes a um, uh, her animula, and then in icons that include it, she becomes the queen of heaven, and so where your gaze falls becomes the reality, um, which I think is very, I'm no physicist, but it is very quantum mechanical in nature of things are affected by your spectatorship of it. Mm -hmm. See, even even when you're kind of in the, in the arts and literature realm, the science and, and mathematics always seems to creep up there <laughs> and have an outside that. influence. <laughs> um, in, in the chat, Maria would like to know, um, uh, what is your definition or what exactly do you mean by the postmodern form of Mary? Oh, I meant the postmortem. Mortem. Uh, gotcha. After her death, after um, the apostles have been gained or been gathered from the corners of the earth and they witness her death. Uh, so I'm sorry for the mispronunciation. I meant postmortem form of Mary. <laughs> Although a postmodern Mary would be also an interesting concept to to sort of unpack. <laughs> yeah, I think that may be my next project, postmodern Mary. Yes. <laughs> Um, and then Tanya Shepard just had a comment about um, Russian peasants and how, you know, very superstitious they often were and, and often, you know, had this pagan background. Um, and, I, and I do want to mention we will have a lecture coming up in January um, by Christine Warbeck, uh, where she addresses uh, this very thing, uh, the peasant relationship to superstition and uh, sort of the, the pagan roots of, of Russia. Um, but she would like to know, would you see that concept of ghosts um, in the in the past of believers? Yeah, thank you so much. This is actually something that I've been thinking a lot about and trying to figure out for myself. Um, within <clears throat> studies of Russian religious culture, we often talk about the notion of boyeveria or double faith, or sometimes we're translated as folk orthodoxy, mm -hmm. which is this idea that the pagan past was kind of just the names were changed. Um, and the, the reality of it remained, but Perun, the god of thunder, became Elijah, and they just changed the name, and especially for, especially for peasants in the countryside, the name changed, the figure did not, um, which has been a very compelling and productive lens of looking at um, medieval, specifically medieval, um, but also 19th century peasants' religious culture, but it has come under some scrutiny in previous years that perhaps this is an academic invention of the 19th century. Um, and there was a book that came out, I believe, in 2007. Um, and I, it's by Stella Rock, and I think it's called Russian Folk Belief, but I may be wrong about the name. Um, and, or no, I'm sorry, it's called Popular Religion in Russia, Double Belief and the Making of an Academic Myth, which presents a strong argument to this idea that the folk orthodoxy is an academic myth. I don't know if I fully buy it, but I do think there are these elements that find a continuation 
which is a large uh, thrust of my first chapter of my dissertation, which I turned in uh, this summer, this idea of perhaps the pre-Christian cult of ancestors um, found its relief in different forms and through different belief systems in medieval and contemporary religious practices. For example, the um, like the ancestor feast that happens um, where people will go to cemeteries and have um, a meal at the gravestone or at the grave site of a loved one um, is, and um, this can be a way of, this can be seen going back before the Christianization of Rus that <clears throat> there's a continuation of this belief in the persistence of the dead in the world of the living. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it needs some more investigation too, because this isn't, it's really, it's not unique to the Russian situation or the Russian situation or the Christian situation. Right. Um, or it seems like the, everywhere you look, people have been believing in ghosts forever. Absolutely. And on that note, I think we will conclude. Brett, thank you so much for this really so fascinating much. talk. All these great questions. <laughs> yes. And, um, you know, of course, if, if people have questions, you know, after the lecture, feel free to email me. I can pass them on to Brett. We can continue this conversation and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you again. Thank you.